Luke chapter 17 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to turn over there, Luke chapter 17. Uh, right before Jesus was arrested and crucified, he spent three hours in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And if we think about the situation and the circumstances of why he was praying and, and, and what was going on in his life, most of us, if we put ourselves in his shoes, would have spent that time praying about us. Lord, let this cup pass from me. Lord, uh, help me not to feel the pain. Lord, don't even let me have to go through this, this arrest and this, this crucifixion. But when we look into John chapter 17 at what Jesus actually prayed... It's kind of astounding that he didn't pray for himself so much as he prayed for us. He prayed for the church. He prayed for, for you and me. And in John chapter 17, it records some of that prayer. Jesus speaking to the Father, beginning in verse 13, he says to his Father, He says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they, talking about us, talking about the church, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus' prayer to the Father has become one of the most difficult expectations for the church to live out down through the ages. Here's the, the deal that we're living in. As Christians, we're living in this world. But Jesus has called us and prayed for us not to be living of this world. Not to be affected by all the things that are going on around us morally and doctrinally. And the way that we think and, and, and the way that we live. Not to allow the, the moral compromises of this world to have that effect on us to where we change who we are and what we are. And, and how we live out our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And the problem with that is, is that when we take a hard stand on the word of God. We say we're not going to give in to the moral compromises of the world. We're going to be hated. We're going to be hated by, by those that choose to. And this really shouldn't come as a surprise to us because Jesus found it to be such an important issue that he spent his last three hours of freedom on this earth before he was arrested and killed. He spent those three hours praying about it uh, and praying for us. Yet every generation of Christians has struggled to maintain our place in this world while still not compromising who we are and who we're called to be and how we're called to live out the Christian life. Every generation's struggle has been a little bit different, but every struggle has come from the same place. It's come from Satan. It's come from the devil. As Jesus calls him in our text for this morning, it's come from the evil one. And the devil, he, he, he doesn't have some deep bag of tricks that's highly intellectual or anything like that. But what he has in his bag of tricks is very effective. And with each generation, what he does is he reaches into his little bag of tricks and he pulls one out. And, and he tweaks it just a little bit and does his best to lead us astray. All the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. When Satan was tempting Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. He told Eve that if she ate of that fruit. That she would become like God. That was a pretty strong temptation. So of course she went and she ate of the fruit because she wanted to be like God. And Adam ate of the fruit because he wanted to be like God. But as soon as they ate of that fruit, they realized that Satan was lying. They did not become like God at all. That was all make-believe. They didn't become like God one bit. They were still people. She was still a, a woman. He was still a man. The only difference was that now they had sinned because they had done the one thing that God had told them not to do. Do not eat from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of the good and evil. Can you imagine living in a world where there was only one rule? Don't eat from that one tree. You can go out in the whole rest of the world, do whatever you want, eat whatever you want, go wherever you want, but don't go over there and eat of that one tree. It seemed like they'd have went and built a wall around that thing just to, to keep anybody from down through the ages being tempted by it or going and cutting the thing down and using it for firewood or something other. But instead, what they did is they gave in to that temptation and they did the one thing that God told them not to do. Satan lured them into sin 
by causing them to question something. He caused them to question their identity. Did they really have to be just people? Did they really have to be just a man? Did they really just have to be a man and a woman in the garden? Or could they become like God? Could they become God himself? He lured them into sinning by having them question their identity. You know, Satan, he recycles the same old temptations in every generation. He packages it a little different to make it effective in the current culture, but it's still the same old temptations that he throws our way. He tempts us in every generation to question our identity. Satan wants us to have an identity crisis. He'll twist and turn things around to where we believe the, the biggest, craziest lies and we make the craziest moral compromises all in an attempt to help us or to lead us into an identity crisis. And the reason is he doesn't want us to simply be content being God's children. He doesn't want us to be content being man and woman on this earth to go out and, and live and enjoy the kingdom of God. We're seeing this now in our culture. And it's kind of hit, it's become, it's exploded here in the last uh, few years. It's even become a political thing where uh, we've got dudes now, hairy chested dudes that have changed their pronouns to she, her. And like we're all supposed to play make believe with them and, and go along like this is a woman now. And if you don't, you're, you're bigoted and you're mean and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and we're supposed to tune into sporting events and watch a guy enter into the woman's 100 meter event in track. And when he blows away the field, we're supposed to give him a dozen roses and celebrate because he's the fastest woman. And, and people are just like, we know this is make believe. Everybody knows this. But if you want to be politically correct, we've just kind of got to go along with it. And that's what Satan tries to do. This is nothing new at all. This is not a new tactic. It goes all the way back to the garden. God, God has given us an identity that he wants us to live by. And Satan wants to, at every turn, cause us to question that. I want to go down through the Bible this morning and look at the scripture because uh, this is one of Satan's greatest, his greatest tactics to get people to, uh, to question themselves and not be or do what God wants them to do, not say the things that God wants us to say. And I want to just look at three people in the scripture that we're very familiar with. Uh, we're going to look at Moses, we're going to look at Solomon, and we're going to look at David. You know, we're familiar with these guys, but we're going to look at instances in their lives when Satan came along and he tried to get them to question their identity and how it almost led to some catastrophic things happening in his, in his kingdom. I'll share this one with you first. The first example I want to give you is Moses. Remember when Moses saw the burning bush? It's burning. It's just burning. It's not burning up. So he walks up to it and he's trying to figure out what's going on. God says, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. So Moses does. And he's just astounded. I mean, just this is unbelievable. And uh, then God tells him to do something. He says, Moses, what I want you to do is I want you to go back to Egypt and stand before the king, stand before Pharaoh, and deliver a message to him from me. I want you to tell Pharaoh that God says, let my people go. Now, Moses was a man that had a lot of confidence. He had done some things before. Uh, he had taken some bold steps before. But as soon as God tells him to do this, Satan whispers in his ear and tempts him by causing him to question his identity. Listen to how Moses responds to God's command in Exodus chapter 3 verse 11. Moses says, who am I? He's questioning his identity. Who am I that I should appear before Pharaoh? God had said, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses, he's, he's sitting here and he's questioning himself because of Satan's temptation. He says, well, who am I to say anything about that? Who am, I to, who am I to be a spokesperson for God? How many times in your life has Satan silenced you with that same lie? Where you've seen something that somebody needed to speak up about. Or you've heard something that somebody needed to speak up and correct because it was wrong. And... You wanted to, but you just didn't feel like you were the right person to do it. And, and, and Satan whispered that lie in your ear. Who are you to say anything about that? I tell you what, he's gotten me plenty of times. He's gotten me plenty of times where I was silent in situations where I should have spoke up. Where I saw things that were wrong and should have spoken up. But he whispered that lie and said, who are you to step up and, and say anything about that? 
And I would bet if you're sitting here this morning and you're honest with yourself, Satan's gotten you before in that too. Here's how it typically goes down. We're sitting there and we, we see something or we hear something that is wrong. And instead of responding, instead of uh, standing up for justice or standing up for what's right or truth, instead we just sit there in silence instead of, refront, instead of confronting it. And later we regret that. And we wish we had said something. And then what we do is we replay that thing in our minds and we come up with the speech that we should have given or we come up with that comeback that we'll give next time we're in that situation. We say, all right, that's, that's what I'm going to do next time. But then the next time we're in the same situation, what do we do? Do we allow Satan to get us again and, and have us question our identity and not say anything again? Or do we find that boldness? Because what Satan wants to do is he wants to... To shame us into silence because of that question, who are you anyway? Who are you? He's questioning your identity. He's causing you to question it as well. The second example I want to share with you this morning from Scripture is, is King Solomon. Uh, the Lord told Solomon at one point to go out and build the temple. Now, build, building the temple for God, this was the first temple that was going to be constructed for the Lord. This was going to be a huge honor, but also a huge responsibility to be able to build this temple for God. Now, Solomon was a man that was very blessed. He had the resources. He had the know-how. Uh, he had everything lined up that God had blessed him with to go out and, and be able to do this. But as soon as God tells him, go ahead and do it, Satan whispers in his ear and he has him questioning his whole identity. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6, Solomon responds to God. He says, you know, who can really build him a worthy home? Not even the highest heavens can, can contain him. So who am I? He asks that question again, the same one that Moses asks. Who am I to consider building a temple for him except as a place to burn sacrifices to him? Well, God was the one that told him to go build the temple. God provided the resources and the know-how and the ability and laid everything out for it. But when Satan comes along and gets him to question in his identity, he's, he responds by saying, who am I to build the temple? In other words, who am I to do anything and do anything for God? Who are you to do anything for God? It's the question Satan asks us so many times. I, I've heard people in church before have this same thing. They want to do something for God. They want to do something to serve but Satan whispers that in their ear and, and they get to questioning themselves. It typically goes something like this. Somebody says, says I would love to teach a Sunday school class, but who am I? I, I? I probably don't know enough. I would love to sing with a praise team and, and help lead worship, but who am I? I, I couldn't get up in front, of, in front of all those people. I would love to help out with the youth, but who am I? They've already got enough people that are, that are, that are volunteering. I would love to invite my coworker to work or co coworker to come to church with me, but who am I? I've sinned before. I'm not like some of those other Christians that probably have never sinned, or at least it looks like that on Sunday morning. So who am I to invite somebody to come to church? Satan is really good at having us question our ability to do absolutely anything for the kingdom of God. God calls us to do and what Satan wants to do is come in behind that and have us question our identity by asking that question, who am I? The third example I want to point to this morning is David. When David was just a young guy, he was a nobody. He hadn't made a name for himself yet. He had a nobody job of, uh, of shepherding. It was like the lowliest job you could have. He came from a family of nobodies. Uh, his family name didn't mean anything in, in Israel. But David was given, even in that lowly state, an opportunity to marry the king's daughter. And it was, it was a divine arrangement. God had, uh, God had set this thing up. But Satan comes in and he questions David's identity. And he has David questioning his own identity. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18, David says, Who am I? That question once again. Who am I and what is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? For my father's family is nothing. Now, God himself had arranged this, this thing, this, this marriage, but Satan had David question, who am I that I should be anything in the kingdom of, of Israel? Who am I that I should be anything in the kingdom of God? I believe that is one of the most debilitating ways that Satan gets us to question our identity. Who am I to be anything? Because that lie keeps us on the sidelines and keeps us sitting in the pew Instead of getting up and going out and doing stuff for the kingdom of God. 
It keeps us content to sit there and watch other people do stuff, watch other people serve. Because when we do that, we can just criticize them and pick on the way they do it instead of actually doing something. And, and it, it just it leads to a mentality that's very unproductive in the kingdom. Who am I that I could ever be anything? The Bible's full of examples of folks that Satan came along and, and tempted by having them to question their identity. And so many of them in Scripture gave in to that temptation and they fell to it. And they shrunk back into really oblivion. And we don't even talk about these people in the Bible. They're just a little blip. We, we read about them. Uh, we know they're there. But we don't even hardly ever think about those people that, that shrunk back and ignored the voice of God. And instead gave in to that temptation and listened to the voice of Satan in their lives. But then we have men like we ha we've got in our text for this morning. And there's women throughout the Bible that we can look to as a great example. We've got folks that, like we looked at this morning, when, when Satan asked Moses, who are you to say anything before Pharaoh? He responded by going and standing in front of the king and saying, God says, let my people go. When Satan asked Solomon, who are you to do anything about building the, the temple for God? He responded by building such an amazing spectacle of a temple that people from all over the world came and they worshipped the Lord at that, at that temple so they could hear about God. When Satan asked David, who are you to be anything in Israel? He responded by becoming Israel's greatest king, the scripture tells us, because he was a man who was after God's own heart. So the next time Satan comes along and he questions your identity by asking who are you to say anything? Who are you to do anything? Who are you to try to be anything in this life? Who are you trying to be anything in the kingdom of God? I want you to remember this. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus went to his disciples and he asked the same question that we've been looking at this morning. He said, who am I? And he didn't ask that question because he didn't know. He didn't ask that question because he was having an identity crisis in his own life. He asked the question because he wanted to make sure his disciples knew who he was. And they responded this way. Peter spoke up when Jesus asked, who am I? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. For the old has gone and the new has come. That means that the day that we were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were buried in that watery grave. And that old person was dead. It was put to death with our sin and it's gone. And we're raised to walk in a newness with life. A, a, a brand new person having a brand new opportunity to go out and live a brand new life for Jesus Christ. See, you were washed in his his blood. You're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and you were filled with his spirit. And at that moment, you became a child of your heavenly father. So the next time the devil calls your identity into question, saying, who are you to say anything? And who are you to do anything? Who are you to, to try to go out and be anything in life? Remember who you are. You're a Christian. That's who you are. That's the identity that's been given to you by Jesus Christ and the identity that's been given to you by your Heavenly Father is you are a Christian. Your identity is in Jesus Christ who gives you the power to speak up for Him, who gives you the power to go out and do and serve for Him, and gives you the power to go out and be something in this world and in this kingdom, to be a light in, in this world of darkness. You are a child of God. That's the most important identity that you'll ever have in this life. It doesn't matter... It, it, it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what Satan comes along and tries to convince us of. The fact of the matter is, as Christians, our identity is we are children of God. And that ought to be enough. That ought to just be enough compared to anything else that goes on in this world. Will y'all stand with me this morning as we pray about it? Father, we thank you that when we come to, uh, when we come to your son Jesus... And we receive that forgiveness that you give us a, a new identity. Father, instead of, instead of being lost and wondering and not having the uh, confidence to speak up or, or do or, or be anything for you or in this world, Father, you give us that, uh, that pledge of your Holy Spirit that promises us an eternal life in, in heaven with you. 
And Father, it's with that confidence and with that name of Jesus on us now that we've been sealed with, uh, that we've been marked by, that we can go out in this world and we can serve you, Father. And I just pray that as we leave this morning, we wouldn't leave with an identity crisis in the church, that we would leave knowing who we are and more importantly, knowing whose we are, and that uh, we would just go out and do our best to live for you and to shine a light in the darkness, Father, to help bring others to you as well, Father, as that's our, as that's our ultimate goal. Well, we thank you for the identity that we have in Jesus, and we just pray that we would live by that uh, every single day. It's in his name we pray. Amen.